Good evening, a gesunden winter to each and every one of you as customarily shuls witch each other, the mispalim, when it comes to Motsui Simcha's Torah, and we're heading into the dark nights of the winter. We wish each other a gesunden winter, that's the Minika Oilam, and we hope that everything will come to realization, the beautiful Chodesh Elul, Chodesh Tishrei, and as I may have mentioned to you, I know in one of my shiurim I did say it, um, that the Nanuim of Rosh Hashanah, of, of Sukkot, that we have 18 Nanuim because we shake the lulav in six directions, and each direction we shake it three times. So six times three is 18. And Kadmonim bring that the power of our Shemona Esres, which is 18 brachas, draws its strength from the 18 Nanuim. And it means Shemona Esri of the entire year. That's how powerful the positivity of the Nanuim are, that it can give so much koyach to Shemona Esri that we can effectively ask and be responded to, hopefully, in the positive from the Koyach of Nanuim. Now, this Shabbos is Shabbos Mevorachim, but it's also Shabbos Bereshis. And the Arizal says that the reason the entire Sefer of Bereshis looks like a storybook, the story of Adam and Chava and Cain and Hevel and Noyach and Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef, the Shvotim, it looks like a storybook. Says the Arizal that of the five Chumashim, the holiest is Bereshis. Then it goes down a notch to Shemos, and then down another notch to Vayikra. And he said that the reason that Sefer Bereshis has to be stated, it looks like one story after another, it would seem like it's not the holiest book, that maybe Vayikra that deals with all the Korbanos, that should be considered the holiest. So the fact is, says the Arizal, because it is so holy that if it wouldn't have been put in storybook form, no one could understand it. That the simple shot of every one of the mice, excuse me, that's recorded in Sefer Bereshis is put as a lavush, as a, a facade, and it gives an impression at the simplest of form, that's what happened, but if it was to be recorded at a higher level of the simplest form, no one could understand it because the kavanas and the intentions were so high and so holy. As the Medrash says, that Mizmor Shir Lioma Shabbos that we say Friday night, and then we say it Shabbos morning in the davening, and then at the end of davening, we say it again as the yom, the shir shal yom, is the shir of Shabbos, mizmor shir liyom Shabbos. <coughs> <coughs> and there are a few opinions. Who wrote mizmor shir liyom Shabbos? 
So one of the opinions is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it. One, that the angels, the Malochim. And there's another opinion that Adam Arisha wrote it. And when they said, Tzadik HaTom Yifrach, the Malochim were referring to Adam Arisha. That we shouldn't just think that because he ate from the eight Tzadas, that he was some sort of secondary person. It says in Sfarim, the Arizal brings it, that all the Neshamas to be in this world were in Adam Harisham. Those who you see running to do mitzvahs, their Shoirish Neshama was in the feet because they're running to do mitzvahs. Uh, somebody who uses his hands to give tzedakah, it's a simen, that he may not be running around, but he's giving out, he's doing chesed, that his shoyrish neshama was in the hands of Adam Harisham. So we begin with Boratius, and we have on the same Shabbos this year, as we do in all years, we have Mavarach HaMachodesh Cheshven. And I want to speak to you for two or three minutes <clears throat> on what Cheshven is. Because if you take the Bnei Soska discusses this in depth. If you take a look at the month of Cheshven, you will see there is no Yom Tiv. The day is empty, the month is empty. And there's also no fast day because Teves and Tammuz both have a fast day, but they don't have Yom Tiv. But the Navi Zechariah said, Yehavchu Yomim Elu Lamoadim Simcha that all the fast days that we have, when Mashiach will come and there will be the Geula Shalema, that those fast days will turn into full Yomim Toivim. So even though those months don't have a, a holiday, a Yom Tiv, but they have a fast day that Leos would love for the next 10 million years, will be a Yom because they're going to be transposed and transformed, a metamorphosis of what they are into good celebration. But the month of Cheshven has no fast day and it has no Yom Tiv. Now, when Shlomo HaMelech finished building the Bias, Bias Rishon, the first base on Migdash, he wanted to throw an unbelievable celebration. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I don't want you to do it. It was in the month of Cheshven. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I want you to do it next Tishrei, which meant 11 months later. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Al Pitzivoy, I want you to dance, and I want you to celebrate, and I want you to eat, and I want you to drink. And one of those days in Tishrei was Yom Kippur. And that was the only time that because of the Tzivoy, the command of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that the whole Kual Yisrael ate and drank and danced on Yom Kippur. Because the Torah says not to, and I could have brought, and not, the Torah was written by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So now if he said to dance and eat and drink, that's what you're supposed to do. And indeed, they made the celebration and dedication and inauguration of the first 
bias, the first base of Migdosh, in the month of Tishrei. So the Medrash says that the month of Cheshvin went before our Kodesh Baruch Hu and said, why did you deny me? The honor of having in my month, the month spoke up to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. You took away the celebrations, our Kodesh Baruch Hu answered says the Medrash, and told the month of Cheshvin, don't feel bad, because in the month of Cheshvin, we're going to celebrate the third base of Megdash. The first base of Megdash that you're talking about is going to be destroyed. It's going to stand for 410 years and then be destroyed. But the third base of Megdash is going to be built and it's going to remain here, li oilam void, for eternity. Now, the third base of Megdush, as Chazal Kadmonim bring, is built by the mitzvahs and mice and toivim of Klal Yisrael, which means that not like Ezra or Shloim Melech. Shem HaMelech, who built the first bias, and Ezra, who built the second, that the people had to work and toil to have the Beis HaMikdash. The third is going to come flying down, <coughs> excuse me, flying down, completed, and when it comes down, the whole Klal Yisrael will be davening Mincha on Harabayas in front of the third base of Mikdash. It will not require, and as a matter of fact, the Noyim Elimelech once lamented and said, and he sighed, that we're supposed to be building the third base of Mikdash with our mitzvahs and Maisim Tovim down here. Yeah and that it's happening up there, I unfortunately was not Zoycha to build or do anything for that Beis HaMikdash. And at night he had a dream and they showed him in HaShemayim that not only did he contribute a little bit of cement or a little bit of a brick, but complete Kalim with his avoid of what was created. So that when he felt bad, they wanted to console him and to make him feel good about the third base of Migdush. And the celebration and dedication for that base of Migdush will be in the month of Cheshvah. Some say there's no Yom Tev in Cheshvan because we had so much to be, become part and parcel of our Ruchnius in Tishrei that we don't need that extra push heavenward with any type of mitzvah or Yom Tev that brings us the Birkas Moyadecha in Cheshvan because we had so much in Tishrei. But the Bnei Soska brings down this medrash and explaining why there was no celebration done in Cheshvan for what I just told you. <coughs> One thing I would like to add we know that. The Arizal says that every month corresponds to a different shavit, to a different shavit. And the month of Cheshvan, Ephraim is Tishrei, Menashe is Cheshvan, and Binyamin is. Kislev. Because Rochel is called the Akeris Habayas, 
and her three, the two grandsons, Ephraim and Menashe, and Binyamin, her own son, are the three of the three inaugurations of the three Bate Migdash. That in Tishrei, we just said that Shlomo Melech's bias was inaugurated in the month of Tishrei, and that is the month of Ephraim, the grandson of Rachel. Menashe, which is for the third, is in the month of Cheshvan. And the third month, Kislev, that they consider the main inauguration, Hanukkah, which is in Kislev. And those are the three. One is the son to our grandchildren of Rachel Imenu, who was the essence and backbone of the called the Akeris Habayis of all the three Bate Migdash. Now, Yaakov Avinu didn't want to put his right hand on Menashe. He put it on Ephraim because he said Ephraim was going to be greater. But we know that the eighth month of the year is Cheshvan. And eight is a number which represents Lamala Minateva because it's eternity. And that represents the month that we're dedicating the third base of Migdash. And that corresponds to Menashe. Now, which tells us that even though Ephraim was greater, but Menashe was still the Bechor, and the essence of Yosef HaTzadik flowed into Menashe. And that gave the power for Menashe to be a projector. We say Yisker four times a year on the eighth day. Eighth day of Pesach, eighth day of Sukkot, which is Shemini Atzeres, and then the other two times, Shavuos, which is after 50 days of Svira, four, nine, seven times seven is Shemitah, and the 50th day after seven sevens corresponds to Yoival. So in Yoival, the Shara Hamishim is able to be in that realm of the Olam HaNeshamas, which correspond to the eighth. Because there's no eighth day in a week, there's only seven. But the eighth is Lamalam Menateva, and that's why we say Yisker on those days, Yom Kippur being Keneged Yoival also, as the Shlach Kodesh explains that Shabbos is Keneged Shemitah and Yoival, Yom Kippur is Keneged Yoival. So it's those four realms that we can put the Yisker into because they're all Lamalam Menateva. Anyway, this Shabbos is Shabbos Mavarachim Cheshven. And we hope that after all the truckload and the tremendous vehicle of transporting Shefa to Klal Yisrael will end up happening and it goes off to sale, so to speak, in Cheshvan. We finish Tishrei and all of the beautiful goodness that has been created by the mitzvahs, meisim toivim, and the simcha of Klal Yisrael will go with Klal Yisrael and that they'll be able to tangibly see the brachal trickle into actuality. Now, Parsha's Bereshis is... In the beginning, we know that the second day it does not say Kitov. Why? Because the whole world was filled with water, and on the second day Hashem split the waters, and half went up to the heavens, it's water up there, 
And the other half became our, our oceans, our seas, our rivers, our lakes. That's the water that's down here. But because there was division, which is like machloikis. What's a machloikis? There's division amongst people. It doesn't say kitov, because there was division. So when you see in the Torah that everything, vayar lokim kitov, it doesn't say it by the second day. Because for division, it's not kitov. And even though it was for the best of reasons, Hashem made it a world that we could live in. We're not swimming around the whole time that it was full of only water. So it doesn't say Kitov. But there is a question that is posed by Kadmonim, by Meforshim, that if that is the case, on the first day of creation, the whole world was dark. And then Hashem put light into the world. And it says, Vayavdel, Hashem separated So there was division there too. So why on the first day does it say Kitov? If the whole reason the second day you don't say Kitov is because That if the whole reason that we don't say Kitov on the second day is because there was a division of waters, so division represents Machlokas, so why on the first day when there was a division of Or and Choshech, that there was, it was pushed aside and it was... So, why do we say Kitov on the first day? There was division. So the Mepharshim say a very interesting thing. The first day when there was division, it was good. I, we said the second days, if there's division, it's not good. But a person has to know that when he comes into a situation and he sees a group of people, his friends, co-congregants, and they say that they want to do something and it's not the right thing, then to be divisive is a tremendous, beautiful thing. That means if someone protests and says, no, I don't want to be part of this, this is negativity. I don't want any of this. That's a good thing. And a person like the Chovetz Chaim used to make a suda every single year on a certain day, and no one knew why. And later in life, he said, I want to tell you the reason I make this suda. Because I had a friend when I was young and this friend was a terrible influence. And one day I decided it's time to completely part. And who knows, had I not parted, where I would be today, what would be today? So the division was a bracha, and I make a sudas hodah. On the day that I was made that decision to part from a bad influence. So we say Kitov the first day because it was Kitov. That separating, that when we come into a pitch black room and we take a candle and walk in, it suddenly illuminates. The ore is good, it disperses 
the darkness. When you come in, you can suddenly see. You, could, you were walking in pitch black. You couldn't see where you were walking and what you were doing. And that's why Rav Shamshin Rafael Hirsch, who was such an ish of Shalom, always in his Kehila in Germany promoting Shalom. But when the Enlightenment, the Reform Movement, and the Haskalah came about, he became the leader of fighting those bad forces who wanted to push away Torah and mitzvahs as we know them. And that didn't make him any less Ish HaSholom because he knew that there was a time to be this way and promote Sholom and look aside and all of that, but not in every case. And even to the other extreme of protest and of expression of division, not wanting to have anything to do with the bad forces. Now, we know that the sun and the moon were created equal size and both gave off light. Once the moon came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said, it's impossible to have two kings reigning the world, the son and myself. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as Rashi brings, said to the moon who was complaining, L'chum miatu atzmach. Okay, you feel two can't be equally? Okay, you're going to minimize yourself. You're going to become smaller and you will not exude any more light. You're going to have to get your light from the sun. Now, when this happened, the Pusik says, the Medrash brings it, there were no stars created in the world. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to the moon, because I made you smaller, I want, and the, the Lashon of Rashi is, Lahafis Daito Shalavana. That means that he wanted to give a consolation, comforting, thank you, comforting. And he gave all the stars, like his entourage, his Tzavaam. Now we know there's billions of stars up there. And that was given as a result that now the Levana had no light of its own and the stars give off tremendous light. That was like its shamosim. It was the, the people to service the Levana. And Rashi says it's Kedei Lohofes Daito Shel Levana. Now the Ramah in Evan Ezra says that when a Chosen and Kala get married, they should get married outside under the Kochavim, under the stars. So we learn that what does it mean when we say Thank you. (laughs) 
that commonly held, why did the Ramah pask in this? Because we want that the couple should be fruitful and have many children, just like there's so many stars, so it's like a bracha that they should get married under the stars. But Mepharshim translated differently. And they say that why were the kochavim created? It was to appease the Levana. And the hosts of stars were given to appease that it lost its own light and it was minimized in sound and size and <clears throat> and that the message that the Ramah men <clears throat> the Ramah men was that when a Chosen and Kala get married they want their marriage to be successful and the only way to have a successful marriage is when you are out to appease the other one, like the kochavim that they're getting married under. That we have certain principles and we feel a certain way when it comes to an issue. How much do we stand on that principle? Do we feel that it's worth a fight? Is it worth lack of tranquility? Or is it a time to sometimes move back, to just stay quiet? And as a matter of fact, once the Levana was minimized, the Mephorshim say, why did it lose its light and that it has to rely on the sun? So they answer, because the sun, as the Chazal said, Velo has Shiva. When this was all going on, that the that the moon was complaining, the sun remained silent and didn't stand up to defend itself or to say anything against the Levana. And the truth is that the Das Zekanim says that the sun remained the same size, says Shama Cherpaso Velo we know that there is a tremendous, and the Pasuk says, Ne'elovim ve'ena oilvim, people who are embarrassed and don't respond. And they're compared, Kitseis Hashem es pigvuroso. They're compared to like the sun that's strong and bright that comes out. Why did Chazal compare the person who keeps quiet after being embarrassed to the sun? But the answer is because the fact is that the sun did not answer. It became the progenitor. It became the one to give out the light that even the Levana, the moon, who originally had its own light, had to come onto it. That the biggest brach has come from someone who hears his, he's embarrassed, he's yelled at, or he's whatever, and he doesn't answer because there is no greater temptation to respond to negativity thrown at you especially if you have something good to answer, that the person would be like a knockout punch. But the person doesn't say it, that he is able to be zoicha. And many people who have been embarrassed and were given 
the opportunity to answer, but they didn't. People came up to them immediately and asked them for brachas. Like the famous story of Reb Chaim Kanievsky, that a couple came into them who were married 20 years and they were dying to have a child. And Rav Chaim said to them, listen, there's some people that are just destined not to have a child. <coughs> Unfortunately, there are people who don't have children. And the couple burst, the husband and the wife, <coughs> into terrible crying. Rav Chaim saw what he said to them like they were ready to. So he said, I'll, I'll say something to you. The next time that you see a person being embarrassed and they don't answer, run over to them and ask for a bracha. And there was a story in B'nai Brak of an almana. And this couple lived in Eretz Israel in B'nai Brak. And there was a bar mitzvah. And the almana was angry that the apartment next to her, the adjacent apartment, was sold to somebody. And she called them to a din Torah that she's the bar mitzvah, she's the one entitled to, to buy it, it's hers, it's her. And she lost the Din Torah. They said over here, the way the sale took place, it was mutter 100%. But this Almana, every time she saw this couple who bought, not the childless couple, the couple who bought that apartment, she started screaming and yelling. So at this bar mitzvah, this childless couple were there and the almana was a guest there. And the people who bought the apartment were also there. And the door f flew open and she came running into the men's section, this almana, And she ran over to the man who bought the apartment and started screaming and the music stopped and everyone stood in their place and there was such yelling. So the lady and the husband who saw what was going on ran over to the man who was being yelled at and wasn't answering and they begged him, don't answer. And he sat there with all the bizarres till they got the lady out. And this couple came running over to the man. Please give us a bracha for children. And it worked. They were married at that point. And I know people who know this couple and are friends with them. That they were in their high 40s. They were married 22 years, 23 years. They, that year, Ten months later, they had a baby boy, and it was because that man didn't answer. And that's what the Chazal are talking about with the moon, with the sun. It was being trashed on by the moon. Why should they he be here? You're thinking that, and the Chazal say it was the size of the moon that convinced the moon that. She had the right to be the one king. And she wasn't. And that's a message to each and every one of us. That we sometimes think that we are ready and we deserve this or that. This position, this leadership position in the PTA, the men's club in the shul, to the... We think that we are the one ready and able to be, but sometimes we're not. And there's something else that our talents that we possess and we never utilize 
could be used to bring out unbelievable qualities and not what they themselves think they're fine. That's exactly what happened with the moon. The Medrash says she thought because of her size <coughs> and the moon today is minuscule, much smaller than the, than the sun. There's no comparison. And that's why she even lost the size, not just the light. So we have to realize that we are sometimes led in a direction to do this or that. And we may not be so happy. We may feel that we were not mazel dick. We were not. But qualities that come our way, opportunities that come our way, Usually it comes our way, it's a sign from Shamayim that our qualities, our characteristics, our abilities are made for that mission. And we should seize the opportunity with a much greater love and enthusiasm than we do. <clears throat> Now, Chazal say that there's two types of chesed in the world. The first chesed that happened in the world was that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Adam and Chava, you have everything, don't forget, they were in Olam Abba. Olam Abba is higher than Yemos HaMashiach even higher than Tchiyas HaMesim. It's Olam Abba. There's the level of the Kinor of David of seven, and then there's eight, and then there's ten. Adam and Chava were in Olam Abba, the level ten, where the whole world is going to revert to after Tchiyas HaMesim, the highest level. And they enjoyed, it was gonna heaven, heaven on earth. And the one thing they told, were told, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> don't eat from the eight tzadas. And the Arizal says it was grapes, and they just, they were created in the ninth hour of the day. And he, they were told that by the twelfth hour, six o'clock, you can eat the grapes, you can eat from the Eitzadas. But they did not have the patience to wait the time. And that's why they were susceptible to the snake, to the Nachash, who got them into the trouble and it then had the ripple effect. And they wreaked havoc in the whole world. We have death in the world because he ate from the Eitzadas. We have sickness in the world. Imagine a world, no cemeteries, no hospitals, no doctors. No, no. That's how they were. And they gave it all up because they couldn't wait till three more hours till the sixth hour. So it was given. And we were thrust into the destructive death and all of these things just because of that. But after this happened, you would think, because there's three psukim, it first says that Hashem cursed Adam and he said, that by the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat bread, meaning you're going to have to work hard for your parnasa. And then the next Pasuk says that he called his wife's name Chava. Why? Because she was the source of all life. She was the first mother in this world. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I gave you a curse that you're going to have to, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to produce your bread. Tocha lechem. 
And you turned around, you didn't yell at Chava and say, look what you did to me by talking me into taking that fruit. But you knew she was embarrassed. So you wanted to find something to cover her embarrassment. So after he was cursed, he turned to her and said, oh, you know, I didn't give you a name. I'm giving you a name now. Your name is going to be Chava, which means life, because you're the mother of all life. So Hashem said, you would have had every right to be disappointed and angry and said something to her, but you chose to find something good to say instead of something bad. So I'm going to cover your embarrassment. And that's why the third Pasek, the first one was the curse to Adam, the second one was he turned and named Chava, the mother of all life. So the third Pasek, right after that, talks about the fact that Vayas Hashem Elohim Kosnos Or Vayal Bishem, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made for them clothes because they realized that they were in a state of nakedness, of, of embarrassment, to cover their embarrassment, Vayal Bishem, and he covered their embarrassment and gave them uh, skins uh, for clothing uh, right after that. So the Medrash says that the first chesed done in the world was done when Hashem gave them the clothing. Because Hashem could have said, Did I gave you such a world and you threw it out the window. I don't want anything to do with you. Go live your lives however you want and goodbye. But Hashem did a chesed with them. You did a terrible thing, but we're going to look forward, not backwards. And he did a chesed. So that, the Medrash says, was the first chesed of the, of, of the world. And the last chesed HaKadosh Baruch Hu did was that he himself buried Moshe Rabbeinu. By Yikbar Oso Bagai. No one knows where Moshe Rabbeinu was buried. So Hashem said that he was going to do that for him. But the Mephorshim have a question on it. By the first chesed, it says Hashem Elohim did it. And by the bearing of Moshe, it doesn't say, by Yikbor Hashem Elohim. It just says, by Yikbor, Bagai. Doesn't say Hashem Elohim. And the Mephorshim, they're very curious why this change, if the Medrash said there's two main chasodim, the chesed that was done, one, the giving of the clothing, and the other, the bearing of Moshe Rabbeinu, why doesn't it say Hashem Elohim by the second one? And the lesson that is learned that they say is that there are two types of chesed. There's chesed that can be, everyone can know your name, no problem. Take the credit. But there's chesed that a person should know that the biggest level is when it's anonymous. So Hashem's name is not mentioned when he did the second chesed. There's sometimes a yeshiva desperately needs money for its, for its staff. And the only way that this person who's very rich will give money is if at the dinner they announce Mr. So-and-so made it happen and all the teachers went home happy. Fine. But there's a higher madriga that the person does not get any credit for the chesed he does. And his name is not mentioned in the act of the chesed. And 
as as nice as it would be for the person, he would enjoy the acknowledgement and he would enjoy the festivities with him being the center stage um, and the the one that everyone is patting on the back. <clears throat> but we learn from here that not always do you have to seek for the chesed you do. Some people go to a nursing home and they feed 10 people who have it, they find it difficult to pick up the spoon and put the food into their mouth and help them. And, uh, and they come to help them. So one type of person wants everybody in the world to know about it. Uh, we're, uh, walks into <coughs> shul <coughs> and says, announces to everyone there, well, I'm just coming from the nursing home and there were eight people that couldn't eat and I did it, Baruch Hashem. Big mitzvah, big there. And uh, we want to hear the response, the chorus. Oh, you were zoichet to such a mitzvah, how beautiful. You're a tzaddikis, you're wonderful. You know? And there's the person who went and fed and took the guff that the lady is frustrated that she can't do it herself. And you're not putting the spoon in her mouth exactly like she likes it and tells you off to boot. So you have to go through the difficulty and the motions and put up with this and put up with that. And you come back into shul, not a word is said. That is the highest level. And that is the reason that, I, that Moshe Rabbein, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name is not mentioned by the second chesed, to let you know that there's two types of chesed. And sometimes it even says, if you get all the COVID, it reduces the bushel basket of schus that you have from what you did because you're already getting some schar. You're enjoying the pat on the back. You're enjoying, oh, the tzaddikas, look what she did. And that. So there's nothing wrong with giving a compliment, but we should try to motivate ourselves to do good things without the whole world having to know about it. And it enhances and it enriches the chesed that we do. <clears throat> now, the Pasuk says, Mikol eats hagan tochel. He said to, Akkadosh Baruch Hu said to Adam, you can eat from every fruit except that. So the Meforshim asked that if it was forbidden, why did Akkadosh Baruch Hu have to put it there to begin with? Look what ended up happening. <coughs> he couldn't hold himself back <coughs> and he wreaked havoc to the world. Please excuse my hoarseness from the singing and the dancing in shul on Sunkus Torah. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable to hear somebody clearing his throat and coughing and forgive me. So what do they have to put it out? And why right after that Pasek? where it says that you can eat from every fruit, but not from that. The next passage says, Hashem wanted to make a Ezer Kenegdo, a wife for Adam. Why that passage right after about the fruit, that you could eat from everything, but there's something forbidden. And the answer is, and this, the Evan Ezra talks about. And he says, 
that the reason that the first human being had to have the forbidden fruit right there to teach him that this is a world of limitation. You can enjoy yourself, but there's a limit. You cannot go everywhere. You cannot look everywhere. You cannot participate everywhere. That there are things that you can do, but there are things that you cannot do. And that's why in this Pusik, where it tells them that you could eat from every fruit, but not from that, right after that, it's about marriage. Because we can produce the most beautiful children we can have homes with lots of chesed, but we have to realize that there are limitations. There are limitations in what you can say to a spouse. You may want to be upset and tell them off. You have to learn how to keep quiet. That we can be told that we can go and have a beautiful dinner, but there's so many foods we're not allowed to eat. We can't just eat anything we want. And that instilled into the Bria, into the creative world, that human beings are taught and live by limitations, and that they have to know that they have an obligation to exercise restraint every day of their life. You're tempted to say something, sometimes you have to stop yourself and don't say it. There's a food, you're better off without eating it. Or you're not allowed to eat it. And this goes through our machshava, dibur, and maisa. So as <clears throat> we begin the year, with all of the resolutions of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and we come to the mundane, to the physicality of each and every day, that we start off the day and end the day, we hope that there was a dent and that there was a mark made on our resolutions that at the end of a day, we'll see some, even a minute, difference in how we do things and how we say things. We're coming now to the first Shabbos of the year. After the Yom Toivim, I'm not talking about Rosh Hashanah, we have the first, uh, but <clears throat> the idea that this Shabbos after all the dancing and singing and promising our Kodesh Baruch Hu, that there should be a mashahu, at least. One item, one tefillah, that you daven shman esrei better. And you're not dreaming about what you're doing, Motsoi Shabbos. Like one Rebbe once came over to a mispalo and said, Shalom Aleichem. He said, Rebbe, Shalom Aleichem. I've been here, the, I didn't go even on vacation this year. And Shalom Aleichem, as if I returned from somewhere. He said, yeah, I was referring to all those machshavas you had in Shemun Esra. You were here, you were in Eretzrael, you were in Australia, going on a business trip. So for all that traveling, I have to say Shalom Aleichem to you. So we should be able to see tangible actuality of our growth and our improvement. A good Shabbos and a good Chodesh. Haba Oleinu Letoifah.